The following is a special presentation of Hearst Television. A primetime matter of fact, state of addiction. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this important event. Tonight, we take part in a live national conversation about the number one health crisis in America, the opioid epidemic. All year long, we've been reporting on the state of addiction in Iowa and how it's impacting our communities. Tonight, we dive deep into the problem and look for solutions. To help answer your questions, we've got a studio phone bank. You can call the number on your screen and have a confidential conversation with our experts. For now, we go live to the museum in Washington, D.C., and our colleague, Matter of Fact host, Soledad O'Brien. We're glad to be with all of you tonight and humbled by the task we've taken on. Consider this. Today, in our country, as many as 650,000 opioid prescriptions were dispensed. And sadly, today, as many as 175 Americans died from a drug overdose, whether opioids like heroin or fentanyl or the new synthetic drugs emerging every day. Tonight, we hope to help the nation turn a corner. This broadcast reaches across 39 states with the potential to touch families in 21 million households. Our goal is to help create a national agenda for action. We'll be joined by medical experts and policymakers, people in positions to make change happen with your help. So let's start in a community desperate for change. Jessica Gomez reports from McDowell County, West Virginia, a state where one person dies every 10 hours from a drug overdose. On a Sunday morning, this is where you'll find Pastor Martin West. We need to know what the Word of God says. That's delivering a sermon to his rural McDowell County Church. Now they come to you or they still out. During the week, he's Sheriff Martin West. Because of the number of people that's dying, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure. McDowell County, it was once called the billion dollar coal field. The streets were constantly lined with people, had three theaters here, we had three hospitals here. That was then. Most of the coal mining jobs left and so did the people. A lot of people that stayed and, you know, they tried to make it and things just kept getting worse and worse. The drug problem started escalating. The jobs that were left, injury prone mining and manual labor, coupled with the emergence of powerful prescription pain medication, it created the perfect storm of addiction. The worst part of it is watching them daily. Their life just drained from them. Yvonne Church's son was prescribed the painkiller OxyContin after nearly cutting off his thumb in a construction accident. He was hooked. One November morning, she found him on her doorstep. She had tried everything. When I found my son, there was a smile on his face. And it hurt because whatever it's a drug is that puts a smile on somebody's face when they're dying, what a hold it has on a person. Stephen Kissinger, an addict in recovery, knows that hold she's talking about. It becomes number one in your life. You can't get out of bed the next morning unless you got one. You can't get up and go fix a cup of coffee if you ain't got one. It, it consumes your whole life. Nothing else matters. So since the last time you were here... Kissinger waited three months to get into Southern Highlands, one of only a couple of outpatient treatment centers in the county. There are funeral homes here, but no long-term rehabilitation facilities. Kissinger's brothers didn't make it. He's now worried about his kids. It's a way of life for some of these children, that they see that their brother is an addict or their mom is an addict. So many children are removed um, from the homes and placed into foster care or for adoption. When you sign in, you have to have your identification. At Linda McKinney's food bank, she often sees grandparents raising grandchildren, their own children addicted, in jail, or dead. In the poorest county in the state, now nearly 50% of children don't live with a biological parent. I said, what's going on here? Where, where are these babies gonna go? Who has the answer? A community in crisis. Sheriff West finally had enough. 
It's a McDowell County problem. The case should be tried in McDowell County. With help from law firms in Charleston, Sheriff West spearheaded the county's lawsuit against three of the largest prescription drug distributors, claiming profit and greed motivated them to ignore laws requiring them to report suspicious orders. This while flooding county pharmacies with millions of pills, well in excess of what would ever legitimately be needed. The little guy's not just gonna back down. Uh, it's a little county, uh, not a lot of people there, but they're not just gonna roll over and, and um, be a victim of these, these entities any longer. Oh, okay, well thank you for sharing that information with me. Meantime, the state of West Virginia, which created a 24-hour hotline connecting addicts to the closest treatment options, is taking proposals on where to spend dollars it won from a similar lawsuit. I married uh, three of one family. Sheriff West, who's lost exact count of the number of funerals over which he's presided, says the help is not coming fast enough. And they keep telling me we're forming more commissions. And I'm saying, well, people is dying now. We need help right now. Lord, it just wants to praise you. Prayer. Sometimes it feels like his only option. And publicly calling out state lawmakers, he says, have failed his county. When we were the billion dollar coal fields, everyone stopped by for a handout. Now that we're in desperate need, we're being left out because no one in Charleston cares. God forgive the state of West Virginia and God save the county of McDowell, Sheriff Martin West. In McDowell County, for matter of fact, I'm Jessica Gomez. Thank you, Jess. We invited the pharmaceutical distributors named in the lawsuits to participate in our show, but they declined. We did receive statements from some saying in general, they believe the lawsuits are misguided because they're not the ones actually prescribing the drugs. Many people across the country are grieving the loss of a loved one and struggling with the stigma often associated with these deaths. So tonight, we're asking you to help us build a virtual wall of remembrance on social media. Use our hashtag, it's State of Addiction. Share a picture, a video, a story, a tribute to someone you want to remember for their life, not their struggle. And we hope if you have a story of hope, you'll pay, post that as well. There's something really wrong with my beautiful 21-year-old son dying. What does it take to loosen the grip of these drugs on our children? And a reality-based discussion, how to get help for those who need it. And right now here at KCCI, we are ready for your questions about opioid addiction, treatment and recovery. To speak with one of our experts, call the number on your screen. Any personal information will be kept confidential. Call if you or someone you know needs help. Welcome back to Matter of Fact, State of Addiction. If you've ever wondered if addiction is a choice or a chance, there's proof it can begin with a single pill. Researchers for the CDC found that of the people given a one-day opioid prescription, only a single day, 6% will get hooked. The number doubles when the prescription is for eight days or more. A 30-day prescription pushes the risk even higher with 30% of patients likely becoming addicted. So how do you effectively treat people once they're dependent? It's a question that will haunt one mother forever. Things. What sports did he play? Snowboarding mm -hmm. and skateboarding. He really liked... Push himself. Yeah, he liked the extreme. Chris Yoder's love of extreme sports would be his downfall. He tore his meniscus snowboarding at age 15, which led to a series of knee surgeries and a battle with depression. Each time he was given opioids to kill the pain. A year later, his mother discovered he'd begun to use heroin. How many times was Chris in and out of rehab? at least six times. Desperate, his mother, Dee Dee Yoder, finally found something that seemed to work better than the expensive rehabilitation programs, a treatment that could break Chris free from his addiction. So he was on Vivitrol in 2016, you said? Yes, the beginning of March. March of 2016. Yeah. How long did he use Vivitrol successfully? Uh, for a, a year. 
For a full year, medication kept the now 21-year-old off of heroin. For the first time in five years, the medication he was taking, Vivitrol, repressed his craving for drugs. They sit on the medicine shelves collecting dust. We are unable to get them to the patient. Dr. Stephen Ross is the director of addiction psychiatry at Bellevue Hospital in New York. Uh, Suboxone comes in a film version that goes on your tongue. And it's frustrating because there's a lot of good treatments, but the vast majority of people never get them. The Surgeon General estimates that only one in ten substance abusers are getting any treatment at all. And just one in four of those are getting these life-saving medications. You had psychologists, psychiatrists, rehab specialists in six different places. Did at any time any of them say, you know, there's evidence that taking drugs will help in kicking this addiction? Well, actually, the doctor at his last rehab was the one that said, you know, we should get him on Vivitrol. Dr. Yasmin Hurd is director of the Center for Addictive Disorders at Mount Sinai Medical Center and studies how drugs affect the brain. Heroin abuse is a whole brain disorder. There are specific circuits that are more impaired, but it's a whole brain disorder. The opioid treatments, they interact with opioid receptors so the person doesn't crave and, and need the heroin um, or other addictive drugs. An estimated 40% of those on medication-assisted therapies will still relapse. But the rate of relapse in programs without drug therapy reaches as high as 90%. Abstinence, 12-step programs, I mean, I think AA works for a lot of people, but for a teenager, they just don't get it. You know, they're just not there. A year into his Vivitrol treatment, Chris moved to Florida for a new job and a fresh start. There, he found few doctors certified to administer the drug, and just one on his insurance. Chris missed his monthly shot. So what happens if you don't get your shot of Vivitrol in a month? Someone's on Vivitrol, they miss their shot, the breathing part of their brain has become sensitive to opiates again, they relapse, their memory was to use however many bags, and then they die. This gut-wrenching, too soon death of Chris Yoder. Twenty days after missing his monthly dose, Chris relapsed and died of an apparent overdose. I've tried so many other things, like the normal root of doctors, hospitals, therapies, therapists, rehabs, and none of them seem to be the right root. There's something really wrong with my beautiful 21-year-old son dying. The responsibility of confronting the opioid epidemic falls in part on local health commissioners. And Dr. Lena Wen is the health commissioner for the city of Baltimore, an emergency room physician. Dr. Wen issued a blanket prescription for naloxone, the opioid antidote, to all residents of Baltimore. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining me. Why? Why a prescription for everyone for, nar for naloxone or Narcan? I'm an emergency physician, and I've seen how someone who is overdosing and about to die will be walking and talking within seconds of getting Narcan. And it should not just be first responders who can save a life. In Baltimore, I issued this blanket prescription to 620,000 people. We've done over 25,000 trainings in two years, and as a result, everyday residents have saved the lives of over 1,200 of their fellow residents. So that is reviving, but it's not really treatment. Are you approaching it from the, from the wrong end, at the end of the spectrum, if you will? We treat addiction the same way that we treat any other disease. For example, heart disease. It's important for us to focus on long-term treatment, and ideally we prevent someone from having heart disease in the first place. But if someone is dying from a heart attack right now, it's our job to save their lives right now. And if we don't give people naloxone to save their life today, there's no chance for a better tomorrow. President Trump declared the opioid crisis a, a national emergency, but he actually hasn't signed the paperwork that would go to Congress that would release the funds. What would those funds do for you? How would that help? So a federal declaration of emergency means resources, and we desperately need them. We're out of money for, for naloxone. We're having to ration this life-saving medication, and I have to decide every day who gets it and who does not. And we desperately need money for treatment as well. Across the country, only one in 10 people with the disease of addiction can get the help that they need. And in the ER, I have to tell patients to wait weeks or months 
to get the treatment that they desperately need. Are you seeing any positive trend? I mean, one in 10, that's an insane number when you consider that we've been thinking about this um, crisis for 20 years. And we would never find it acceptable for any other illness. We would never say, well, only one in 10 patients with cancer can get chemotherapy. The conversation is changing, but what is holding us back is stigma. Stigma kills, and we have to fight stigma with evidence and science. Dr. Wen, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Still ahead, questions for the DEA. Who are they investigating? How are they going after this? Are they doing enough to stop the flow of drugs into the country? If you are looking for help for yourself or a loved one, we want to help direct you to the right place. To speak confidentially with one of our experts tonight, call the number on your screen with any opioid-related questions. And stay tuned. Coming up at 9.30, we turn to the local issues and the latest developments in Iowa's opioid crisis. We're talking about solutions and guidelines in the medical community necessary to combat America's opioid addiction. We're going to pick up that conversation in just a moment. But first, I want to give a thanks to everyone who's helping us build our wall of remembrance online using the hashtag State of Addiction. Tanya Bryant shares this with us. Swillard Bryant Jr., you were the best little brother to Tonka and me and son to our parents. We miss you. And Molly Carroll sent us this message. Erica Long was a beautiful, hilarious, intelligent young woman. Our family was robbed and heroin was the thief. Thank you for sharing those. We want you to honor your loved ones or share a story of hope on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Just use the hashtag state of addiction. So did health officials fail to recognize the scope of opioid addiction before it became an epidemic? We continue our conversation. Joined now by Dr. Kelly Clark. She's a president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And Dr. Andrew Kolodny. He's a co-director of the opioid policy research at the Heller School at Brandeis University. Nice to see both of you. Um, let's start with patients. And I mean, we've seen in our reporting that many are steered away from medically assisted treatments. Has that been your experience and, and why would that be? Yes, actually most of the facilities in the country that are treating substance use disorders, and specifically opioid addiction, don't offer medication, uh, maintenance medication while their patients are inpatients and often they don't allow it. Some of this is based on stigma, some is based on uh, just their historical needs, but we're just continuing to do the things that don't work in this country instead of the things that do work. The $64,000 question for me, Dr. Kalodny, always seems to be, how did health professionals miss this epidemic that was sort of blossoming right underneath them? Yesterday I was in the ER with a friend who was in a cab accident, and so many times she was offered opioids, even though when they'd ask her about her pain, she'd say, yeah, it's a five on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst, almost aggressively. And it made me think maybe that explains why we are where we are. That's absolutely right. The reason that the United States is experiencing a severe epidemic of opioid addiction is because the medical community has been over prescribing opioid pain medicine. And as the pain medicine prescribing went up, it led to parallel increases in addiction and overdose deaths. So this is an epidemic caused by the medical community writing too many opioid prescriptions. And did the medical community just not realize what was happening or who's ultimately the, at fault there? The reason we started to over prescribe is that we were responding to a brilliant multifaceted campaign launched by the manufacturers of opioid pain medicines. So doctors beginning, beginning in the 90s through the 2000s, we were hearing from just about every direction that if you're a compassionate, caring doctor, you'll understand that opioids are the right way to treat just about any complaint of pain. And we were told that the risk of addiction was very low. And of course, that, that wasn't true. What works in prevention? I mean, one would think those scared straight kind of ads for kids would be effective, are they? Actually, they're not. We continue to do wasn't what doesn't work. So the scared straight, the educational programs where uh, drugs will kill you, uh, don't, please don't do drugs, sending someone into the school to talk to them about the dangers. None of those, that works? No, actually, they, that increases the chance that kids use drugs. Wow. 
Similarly, uh, going through a detox and a rehabilitation when people aren't leaving on maintenance medication actually increases the chance that they die than if they hadn't gone through those prog programs. We're doing what we know doesn't work instead of what we know does work. And the things that do work, there are community-based resiliency skill training. We have a whole plethora. We've got a, a, we have a number of things we know work for prevention. We're not doing those. And we know that the medications are the most uh, effective treatments, ongoing medication treatment for opioid addiction. And unfortunately, we still have too many treatment uh, providers that don't even allow that treatment. It's interesting feedback you get sometimes from people of color who will say to me, yes, yeah, suddenly people are really compassionate and thinking about how to deal with this problem. It's an epidemic when the bulk of the people who are victims are white and that that compassion wasn't there when you were talking about the crack epidemic or even the earlier heroin epidemic. Is that true? It, it is true. Uh, during our last addiction epidemics, the heroin epidemic of the 1970s, the crack cocaine epidemic of the 1980s, what we got from policymakers was a message that we could potentially arrest our way out of this problem. We got a war on drugs, which contributed to mass incarceration. Today, what we're hearing from policymakers, even conservative Republican politicians, when they talk about this problem, they often begin by saying, we can't arrest our way out of it. We didn't hear that back then. It's good that we're hearing it now. It's, it's too bad we didn't hear it previously. Dr. Kolodny, Dr. Clark, thank you so much for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. Still ahead, he lost his son to a drug overdose. We'll meet a federal prosecutor who has a personal perspective on the challenges of taking down dealers. We're still taking your questions about opioid addiction, treatment, and recovery. If you want to speak with our experts, call the number on your screen. Personal information will be kept confidential. We'll be right back with an up-close look at the state of addiction in Iowa. All year long here at KCCI, we've been showing you the numbers and giving you the facts of Iowa's opioid crisis. Tonight, we update you with the latest. The newest information shows some positive change happening in our state, but it also reveals where the problem is worsening. Let's take a look. Iowa has mobilized in the fight against opioid addiction. As awareness has increased, individuals have stepped up to keep unused pills out of the wrong hands. On a national take back day in April, Iowans turned in nearly 12,000 pounds of prescription drugs. Plus, many key players have been working to change the medical landscape. From the exam room... Primary care doctors are becoming much more restrictive um, with their opioid prescribing, and I think that's most times appropriate. To the pharmacy. More than 80% of pharmacists now use the prescription monitoring program, likely a factor in the dramatic decrease of Iowans' doctor shopping. We think that's a really important thing, and it, it's a really good tool. Um, we've seen some, some changes made, for example, uh, now we're able to actually better access data across state lines. Law enforcement has kicked into a higher gear. This year, compared to last, agencies are projecting nearly twice as many seizures of heroin, fentanyl, and other deadly synthetic opioids. But as the state's defenses have strengthened, so has the need for them. In 2016, 86 Iowans died of an opioid overdose. That's a 40% increase from the previous year. And as thousands of Iowans seek treatment for opioid addiction, treatment centers can't keep up with the need. The other providers that I've talked to are full, just like we are. And so that tells me if we're maintaining wait lists of 20 or 30 people, then there should be more beds in the state of Iowa. But there are some signs that better days could be ahead. From the National Emergency Declaration in Washington, which treatment providers are hopeful could lead to more support for more people. There's a lot of hope about federal resources coming through uh, areas like Department of Public Health and others to, to combat this problem. To tangible policy change at the state level, lawmakers recently made the life-saving overdose antidote naloxone widely available. It can now be purchased by adults without a prescription, and it's being used more than ever by first responders. Smaller rural, rural fire departments, for example, a few years ago had never really heard of it that are actually today carrying it. Progress is being made, but so much more is needed to turn the tide back in the right direction where opioid abuse, addiction and deaths are few and far between. 
And joining me now are Kevin Gabbard from the Iowa Department of Public Health and Dale Woolery from the Governor's Office of Drug Control Policy. Both of you have been on the phones tonight and it sounds like it's busy over there. They keep ringing uh, without revealing anyone's personal information. What kind of questions are you hearing, Kevin? The call that I received or the calls that I received have been about uh, individuals experiencing legitimate pain and what are their options. Surgery isn't an option for uh, for an individual, uh, but the alternative is, you know, continuing to take opioids and they know that that's not something they want to do also. And so looking at what are some of their options as far as uh, receiving care. And Dale, when people do call in and ask for help, where's the first place you refer them? What do you tell them? Well, uh, they can seek treatment if treatment's appropriate, uh, and there's a statewide uh, toll-free phone line, 866-242-4111. Your website has a lot of good information, and drugfreeinfo.org is another place where you can go to find local help. And I would just echo what Kevin was saying. Uh, I also hear and heard in the phone calls, don't take pain meds away totally because there are people who can benefit from them, which is why this is a very tricky issue. There are a lot of people out there maybe afraid to call in, maybe afraid to ask for help because there is a bit of a stigma uh, associated, but this doesn't just affect one type of person. Dale, do you want to talk about that at all? What kinds of people does this affect? Oh, it's an equal opportunity player or uh, unfortunately and tragically can be an equal opportunity killer if uh, there's misuse or abuse. Uh, when you're talking about medications that have the perception of safety, uh, a lot of people take medications, a lot of people take pain medications, so we have a lot of those out there and if they're not used as intended, a lot of people can get hurt. So addiction knows no boundaries and that's going to be true with opioids too. Thank you both for joining us. They'll stay on the phones for us tonight. Treatment is one of the most important topics in the conversation. So when we return, we'll give you a look at one option right here in the metro. You'll see what the process is like and hear how two Iowans now in recovery overcame some common obstacles to getting help. Good. Recovery is a lifelong process, but treatment can and does work for many people. In Iowa, there are more than 100 treatment options from inpatient to outpatient, and we recently visited one of them to show you what it's like. Abby Landis and Abby Lennon have more in common than just their names and current address. I started doing opiates when I was about 18, right when I got out of high school, and it gradually went from prescription pills to heroin. I took my first Vicodin when I was probably 22. For like the next seven years, um, I just drowned in, in pills, basically. They're residents of the House of Mercy, one of the largest treatment facilities of its no, kind in right. Iowa. Last year, we served over 1,700 people in our outpatient programs, and we served over 250 in our residential program for women and children. I knew this was a good facility. Um, and I knew I could bring my son with me. Um, and I, I knew that was important to my recovery. One of the first steps in treatment is helping clients reduce their cravings. So we do use medicated assistant treatment. Um, naltrexone is the one that we um, prescribe from our psychiatrist. It's always important to supplement that with counseling. We have education employment counselors. We have the primary counselor. We have, who else? <laughs> Parenting. Um, parenting specialists, um, mental health therapists. I appreciate about this program is just that I had the time to like be here, find outside living resources, find self-sufficiency, and just not be like here for 30 days and then them say, okay, bye, have a good life. House of Mercy has no set time frame for treatment. It's a huge benefit for clients, so but often leads to battles yeah. with insurance companies. My insurance hasn't covered me since December of last year, but you know, I didn't get the boot or anything. Not all of the treatment services are covered, and sometimes it's only a short length of stay that is covered. And then we rely on donors, we rely on grants, and we rely on Mercy Medical Center to help support us. Working to keep clients covered is just one of the daily struggles of an addiction treatment center. Even after after a recent expansion of its inpatient facilities, House of Mercy always has a wait list. It's the same for most other programs like it. They often work together to find help for those who would otherwise be turned away. We would definitely get them started in outpatient services right away, and we would work with other treatment providers 
um, and send referrals everywhere and start making phone calls and doing a lot of case management to try to find out who's going to be able to best serve this individual as quickly as possible. The program's success rate is 70 percent. Even though it's not 100 percent, that really doesn't tell us much because for most medical issues, things like diabetes and uh, whatnot, they would, there's going to be relapses. And so just because there is a relapse doesn't mean that there was nothing gained from the prior treatment. Landis and Lennon are sharing their experiences to inspire others to take the leap. They know that asking for help and especially receiving it is terrifying. When you're alone, it just feels like isolation. And I feel like that's why a lot of people leave after like a day because they don't think that feeling will go away, but it goes away pretty quickly. It is scary, so don't be afraid to say I'm scared. And that's a reason why I don't want to do this. But you just have to know, just stick it out even for two weeks and you will see the difference. And joining me now are Stacy Loftus with the Powell Dependency Center and Rebecca Peterson with the House of Mercy, who you just saw in that story there. Um, for people who are maybe not sure if they do have a problem, they're thinking about it, what would you, you tell them if they're not sure? Well, um, you know, if, if you're wondering if you have a problem, you probably do. Uh, most people who um, drink here and there, um, really don't wonder if they have a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, I think. Sure. So if, if you're wondering, people who just drink once in a while don't wonder. Sure. Might as well ask and, and, and yeah. find out. And Rebecca, yeah. when you are working with someone, everyone's treatment process is going to be different. How do you sort of map out what that plan of action is going to be? Well, it always starts with a full assessment to determine how much the person's been using, what are their current living environments, what are their um, stressors in their life, and really getting a thorough history, and then uh, making a plan from there, depending on what the client needs. Thank you both for being here. We have a lot of information on our website, including a full list of treatment centers in Iowa. We're going to send it back to Soledad in Washington. Next, drug cartels and dealers, several steps ahead of law enforcement. Our labs are seeing two or three new substances a month. Can we get ahead of the bad guys? From starting a high-speed chase, it ended with the officers bringing the overdosing driver back to life. Hit it with the Narcan. First responders treated with Narcan and rushed the patient to the hospital. And this scene is repeated over and over each day. Police, search warrant. Police say the suspect made all of the deals out of his house, where he lives with his three kids. That's a little disturbing. Across the country, a rush to save lives and cut off an influx of illicit drugs. Nearly all heroin is smuggled into the United States. Most synthetic drugs, like fentanyl, ship from China. Now, dealers are making fentanyl here in the United States. So take a look at this. Boxes that hold a key ingredient to make fentanyl. Seized from a Massachusetts storage unit this summer, 110 pounds of the ingredient is enough to make 19 million fentanyl tablets worth more than half a billion dollars. Nicole Killian has our report on the struggle to cut off the supply. I first got involved when I was a first year member of Congress and a constituent came to see me who lived near me back home and her son had just died of an overdose. A decades-long battle against opioid addiction is personal for Ohio Senator Rob Portman. Almost every week, I find out about somebody. His state, number four in the nation for drug overdose deaths, according to the Centers for Disease Control. Ohio is harder hit than most states, but every single city, every single state in this country has been hit. Enter the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the combat force in the nation's war against drugs. What keeps you up at night? Lots of things keep me up at night. Chuck Rosenberg is the acting administrator. We have to enforce the law, which means uh, stopping the biggest and most dangerous cartels and the biggest and most dangerous street gangs. We also have to regulate uh, our piece of the industry and we have to reduce demand. But with only 4,600 special agents, it's a challenge. Compare that number to the nearly 36,000 uniformed members of the New York City Police Department. The notion that the DEA alone by itself is going to be able to uh, you know, stop all of this is fanciful. We need help.
In July, the agency shut down two major online black market opioid sellers, but they know new sources will emerge. Do you think they have enough resources to do their job? Well, we'll see. Congressman Greg Walden chairs the House Energy and Commerce Committee. It's investigating whether the agency failed to prosecute questionable manufacturers, pharmacies, and doctors. Who are they investigating? How are they going after this? How do we have these, these uh, I'll call them pill mills, uh, where, where you've got pill dumping going on in a community? What, what are they doing to go after something like that? Hey, guys. As for Senator Portman, he's pushing a bill that requires the Postal Service to better monitor overseas packages, a massive pipeline for potent synthetic drugs. Most of that's coming from China. We know they use the U.S. mail system. He's hoping for passage by year end, despite competing priorities like disaster relief and tax and immigration reform. This is a true emergency, but it doesn't mean that we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm not going to give up. In Washington, I'm Nicole Killian. The tough job of prosecuting drug offenders uh, falls to federal prosecutors like Bruce Brandler. He's a U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. He also lost his son, Eric, to a heroin overdose about 10 years ago. U.S. Attorney Bruce Brandler, nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. When you look at the numbers, as Nicole kind of laid them out for us in her piece, it feels as if the DEA is wildly overmatched in this fight. Are they? Um, I don't think the picture is as bleak as Chuck has painted. There are hundreds and thousands of dedicated and hardworking law enforcement agents fighting this battle every day in the trenches, and they do an effective and good job of incarcerating drug dealers. So, um, of course, we could use more resources. We could use more prosecutors. Chuck could use more DEA agents. But we are doing an effective job in incarcerating the people we do catch. And the people that you're catching, are those folks who are essentially addicts, who are kind of getting caught up in the system? Absolutely not. I think that's a real misperception out there. Uh, the people that we're prosecuting in federal court are violent criminals who are recidivists, for the most part, who have been caught previously selling drugs and are selling high volumes of drugs. These are not low-level um, addicts who are just selling to support their own habits. Can you arrest your way out of a problem as big as this epidemic essentially has become? No, we all recognize in the law enforcement community that we can't arrest our way out of this problem. And that's why the Department of Justice has a three-part strategy to combat the opioid epidemic. And it deals with prevention, it deals with enforcement, and it deals with treatment. So enforcement is obviously the most important part. We as prosecutors need to prosecute aggressively anybody that we catch. And we have a zero tolerance policy for people that are caught dealing heroin. We mentioned your son died about 10 years ago, but I know it was only in the last maybe year and a half that you started telling people. Has it changed at all how you think about prosecution? Um, I don't know that it's changed how I think about prosecution. Uh, there are many dedicated prosecutors out there who are doing exactly what I'm doing and fighting this battle on a day-to-day -day front, uh, doing the best they can. Um, I, I came out public with my situation because I wanted to raise public awareness and take away some of the stigma and shame that may be associated with the opioid addiction. Tell people that if it could happen to me as a federal prosecutor, it could basically happen to anybody. It's a good message to share. Bruce Brandler, nice to have you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, we continue our conversations about fighting this epidemic. Can the government deliver the help that's needed? We're talking about ways to respond to America's opioid crisis. We're going to pick up that conversation in just a moment. But first, I want to thank everybody who's helping us build our online wall of remembrance using the hashtag State of Addiction. And here's a post that we wanted to share with you, a story of hope from Barb Bowen in Boston, the face of addiction in recovery. Recovery is possible. It's a great achievement, a beautiful life. That's a nice one to get to share. Everyone on our program tonight has been touched in some manner by the opioid crisis. So what should be the national response? Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson is a Republican. He's also chairman of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. He lost a nephew to opioids. It's nice to have you, Senator. Thanks for being also with us. Dad. So what should the government do, be doing or what could the government do better right now to help people because there are so many. I'm sure you hear from them all the time from your state of Wisconsin. Well, you know, we, we do spend about $30 billion per year on the war on drugs. About $14 billion of that is on treatment. 
Uh, from my standpoint, there are three legs to the solution stool. You have supply and addiction, you have treatment, and you have uh, reduction of demand. Uh, it'd be far better if we could reduce demand, if we could do as we've done, for example, with tobacco, where we really have dramatically reduced the uh, demand for tobacco products. We need to do the exact same thing with drugs, but that'll take multi-years, probably multi-decades, public relations, education campaign, just a cultural shift. There's nothing glamorous about getting addicted to drugs and dying in squalor and destroying your family's life, your parents, your siblings, your grandparents' life. There, there's nothing good about that. We need to drum that into our young people's. The president has not signed. He said he wanted to uh, call it a state of emergency, the opioid crisis, but he actually has to sign and then send off to Congress that declaration. But do you think there's any um, indication that he won't? Do you expect that he will? So, Dad, it is a state of emergency. You don't have to have a president sign that. It releases funds, though, realistically, right? That's, we, we, we do spend plenty of money. We need to spend it smarter. And we've got to focus on what actually does work. You had earlier, earlier guests on talking about what works and what doesn't work. Let's do more and more research. Let's find out what does work. In business, that's exactly the approach you use. What is the best practice? And you keep pushing the envelope. You keep, you know, trying to find better and better treatments, uh, better and better messages to reduce the demand. Do you think insurance companies could do more? Often you'll hear from people who are just overwhelmed by the fact that they can't get their kid in rehab any kind of insurance coverage, or insurance only covers certain things, and so that sort of blocks their ability to have flexibility in treatments even. I, I think insurance companies really, again, they're, they're money-making organizations. I think they could actually push the best practices, you know, help the research, you know, fund it, and then it would save them money, but it also, I think, do far better for the American public if we actually had treatments that worked. It's really true. What do you tell to, not just your constituents, but people in general? I mean, there's just, it's heartbreaking when you see on this wall of remembrance just so many people, and the, and the victims are so young across the board. You know, oftentimes we have uh, middle school and high school students come visit us in our Senate office, or I go to those schools. There's ever since I've gotten involved in this, ever since I've talked to parents who've lost their beautiful sons and daughters, there's never a group of children that I don't talk to. And always, you know, number of messages, but I always say, don't do drugs. Now, a lot of times you get snickers, then I tell them about my nephew, I tell them about these parents whose, whose, lives, so, whose lives have been ruined. I say, if you care anything about your parents, or your brothers and sisters, or your grandparents, you know, if you don't care about your own life, think about them because you will ruin theirs by taking drugs. So just don't do drugs. Very difficult conversation. Senator Ron Johnson, nice to have you with us tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. And thanks to all of you who joined us this evening to help us create a national agenda to combat the opioid crisis. As we close, we want to take some time to remember some members of our own Hearst Television family who have lost loved ones to the opioid epidemic. We recognize the loss so many of you have at home and that you face because we have experienced it ourselves. Our colleagues and really their openness and their courage throughout this crisis have served as an inspiration for our efforts tonight. And we'd like you to know that our thoughts are with them and with all of you. From the museum in Washington, DC, I'm Soledad O'Brien.